Hello everyone and welcome to the workshop. Today we're going to take a brief look back into the history of radio communication. The time is 1939 and we have a very special guest today. He's waiting right outside the shop. I'm going to bring him in, introduce him, and we can all get to know him a little bit better. Pardon me for just a moment. And here he is, the S19R shortwave receiver made by Helicrafters in 1939. The S19R was actually an entry-level receiver. Helicrafters wanted to keep the cost low to make it affordable for as many people as possible. And for an entry-level receiver, it did have some very good features. For instance, it was transformer operated. What that means is neither the chassis nor the case could become hot, by that I mean electrically charged, and deliver a fatal shock to the operator. Compare that to some other entry-level receivers later on released by Helicrafters, the S38 series and the Echophone series. These radios were AC-DC models that did not use the expensive power transformer. And what this meant was that the chassis and even the case could sometimes become electrically charged and deliver a fatal shock to the operator. Anybody interested in rewiring the S38 to make it electrically safe, please see my video, Helicrafters S38 Potential Killer. Helicrafters S38 Potential Killer. Now the S19R had another good feature. Most of the entry-level shortwave radios were 5-2 radios. The SR19 had a 6-tube. This tube was dedicated to the BFO. That stands for Beat Frequency Oscillator that let the operator copy Morse code. Now I have used this very receiver to copy single sideband voice transmissions many times with no problems. Well, let's take a look at the front panel and see what the various controls do. The controls from left to right are as follows. A send receive switch, a four position band switch, position one being the broadcast band, an on off BFO switch, beat frequency oscillator. This was used to listen to Morse code. An on off AVC switch, automatic volume control. Here's the main volume control with the power off switch. Here's a pitch control for the BFO. To the far right, you have a jack for your headphones. I really like this kind of a grill cloth because it's not cloth at all. The trouble with cloth is it can rot, deteriorate, tear, and after a few years begin to look terrible. Nothing like a wire mesh to protect your speaker. Now we have two big knobs here in the middle. This knob is the band spread, which is fine tuning. And what you are seeing here is a translucent plastic disc with printing on it, which is illuminated from behind, making it very easy to read. However, a logging scale on a fine tuning knob is not really that useful. Over here, this knob turns a big metal disc that has the bands and the frequencies printed on it silk screened or embossed. The trouble with this idea is it's very hard to read the frequencies, hard to tune the radio. You have to have a good ambient light source in order to read this dial. Now why Helicrafters didn't use the same technique they used on the band spread over here on the main tuning dial is kind of a mystery to me. Apparently they knew how to do it, but it didn't occur to them at the time. Of course, just a few years later, the big metal external disc was replaced by the internal translucent plastic disc lit from behind, just like you see here. Most of the time when you find these old receivers, the triangular plastic pointer is either broken or missing. But that's really no problem because they're easy to make. A lot of foods are packaged in stiff, transparent plastic containers. You just cut out a triangle with scissors, Draw a line down the middle with a repeater graph pen. Drill a couple holes and you're in business. That's how I made this very pointer a few years ago. 
Just imagine trying to read this dial at a working distance of, say, 12 inches in normal room light. It's not very easy. You have to line up the numbers with the hairline on the pointer. The owner of one of these radios solved the problem in a unique way by mounting a number 47 pilot light outside the radio right next to the pointer. Pretty hokey, but I guess it worked. Most of the old shortwave receivers had a hinged cover. You could open the cover and study the warm glow of the vacuum tubes or replace a tube as needed. Now the S19R does not have a hinged cover. You have to remove seven screws and the metal plate comes right off the radio. Let's take a look inside the radio with the cover off. Here is the built-in speaker. Here is the tuning capacitor. Here is the power transformer. Here are two IF transformers. Down here you see the remains of a four-section electrolytic capacitor. I disconnected and I replaced it with four individual capacitors under the chassis. Back here you see the translucent plastic disc. On the other side you have printed a logging scale 0 to 100. And it's illuminated from behind with this little pilot light making it very easy to read. However, it's not really very useful. It's only a logging scale. It would have been a much better idea if helicrafters had used the same translucent plastic disc over here for the main tuning dial where it would be very, very useful. Back here we have a BFO oscillator number 76. Here is a 6SQ7 second detector first audio. Here is the audio output tube at number 41. Here is the IF amplifier at 6SK7. Back here is a 6K8 first detector oscillator mixer. It's attached to the tuning capacitor with a grid cap. Over here is a number 80 full wave power rectifier tube. An interesting thing about this radio is the two IF transformers that don't seem to match although I assume they're the same electrically. Now I've seen this very model receiver with two of this style of IF transformer and I've seen this same model receiver with two of this style transformer. So apparently the mismatch was actually done at the Helicrafters factory. Over the years I've heard many radio amateurs talk about somebody they knew named Elmer. Who the heck is Elmer? How come so many individuals from different parts of the country all knew a gentleman named Elmer? This didn't make sense. Well, it finally occurred to me. Elmer is the generic name for the individual that got someone started in the hobby of amateur radio. Then it occurred to me I had an Elmer too. When I was 13 years old, we rented a room and a bathroom in the back of our Brentwood home to a World War I veteran named Mr. Parham. Mr. Parham brought with him something that was absolutely fascinating. I had never got over it. It was so complicated, so scientific, so wonderful. He brought with him an S19R radio, just like the one you see here. I had never seen something so wonderful in my life. And shortly after, Mr. Parham was teaching me how to solder how to read diagrams, and how to build my very first regenerative shortwave radio. Nowadays, of course, Mr. Parham is way out there in the ether somewhere, but I hope he knows how important he was to me and how grateful I am to him for getting me started in a fascinating hobby, building, buying, restoring, and reselling, and making videos about shortwave radios. Thank you, Mr. Parham, wherever you are. Well, that's all I have for now, folks. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.